Awesome. I like how you bribe people to buy your book. I'm going to borrow that. All right, guys. So now, this is my tremendous, tremendous honor to introduce a friend, a woman that I admire, a hero, a shero, not just for me, but for all of us. Yvonne Cagle is coming up next, who is a NASA astronaut. And let me tell you something. Getting a NASA astronaut on the weekend of the 50th anniversary of Apollo, that's like, does not happen. So, Yvonne is like literally bilocating and sneaking in a trip to us before she goes to be deployed all over the place to be the Apollo person. Um, but I was, I'm going to say, in 2008, Dr. Cagle retired as a colonel in the U.S. Air Force, where she served as a senior flight surgeon prior to her selection to the NASA astronaut corps in 1996. In 2005, Dr. Cagle was assigned to the NASA ARC as the lead ARC astronaut science liaison and strategic relationships manager for Google and other Silicon Valley programmatic partnerships. She is also um, advising now on deep space neurobehavioral research and polar analog simulations for NASA's exploration missions. And something that's really important to me is she has also developed a device to accelerate healing, starting with this kind of eyes toward healing people in flights, eyes toward healing people in space, and now toward healing people on Earth. Yvonne Cagle, I'm so happy you're here. Thank you so much. of a very long haul and uh, you get the best that I have because we're in the beginning so this is great. I wouldn't want it any other way. And um, yes, it's, uh, it's really tremendous to be here. Uh, everyone here is such a hard act to follow. So now you see why I'm trying to actually leave the planet. <laughs> but it's wonderful to uh, see old friends and make new friends. And um, I just wanted to start out and first sort of give some context. That, uh, of, of the mission, of NASA's mission, and that's that we're uh, planning on going, mark your calendars, yes, to Mars 2035. That's really exciting. But we're no longer going direct to Mars, we're going to Mars by way of going, guess what, back to the moon. So happy 50th lunar landing anniversary. We're well on our way. We're doing that in 2024, so what, a few short years from now, five years or such. And uh, we'll, it'll be heralded by two 30-day long missions, two cis-lunar missions that are each 30 days, the first being 2024, preceded by some robotic precursor missions. And we're going to be testing and validating the systems as we, before we go to Mars, ones that we'll be using. So we'll be testing everything from the vehicle all the way to the human and rockets, rovers, and robots in between. Um, but in anticipation of that, the human system is really a fascinating one for me, both on the planet and off. Cassie's right, I have an invention that accelerates the restoration of the human body after injury or deconditioning, turning weeks of therapy after a sprain or strain or overtraining or overwork into days, and days of discomfort and swelling and tenderness into mere minutes, no matter if it's been days or decades. Um, and what's exciting about it mostly is that we have the wind before you can step off the planet. So we've transformed so many lives in being able to really turn things around for folks. But what's going to be very helpful is that when you go into space and you take away gravity, uh, a few things happen to your body, many things, but the most no noteworthy is that your bones start to soften and your muscles start to thin out or weaken because you don't have the pull of gravity, you don't need all of that work. But that deconditions you to the point where it's fine while you're floating around, but when you return to a gravity-based environment, either coming back home or on to Moon or Mars, that can be an issue. So we hope to maybe um, see how this kind of a concept or approach might help to accelerate and augment our restoration when we're off planet. But the other thing that happens is your brain. Some of you may be familiar with uh, the twin study where uh, one of the twins went um, to space for nearly a year, the other stayed here. And uh, it's so great, the one that went to space said uh, that they pulled straws. 
And the one that stayed on earth said, yeah, he got the short straw. <laughs> but in coming home, um, this uh, particular astronaut, uh, as expected, was quite deconditioned. And as we studied his DNA and looked at some of the um, brain profiles of other long duration crew members, we see that the same brain and body that you leave the earth with is not the same one you come back. And that your DNA shifts and that certain changes happen to your gray matter, your brain, and to even your vision. And uh, most of it is just adapting to this new environment, but it can create some new challenges when we come back home. The important thing to know is that the body is incredibly adaptive, and so we evolve based on our environment, such that the alien that we go in search of may actually be ourselves. <laughs> so what is the definition of alien? Well, my definition in part is that an alien is simply any being that has evolved away from the status quo. Now, no, I didn't say status right. I just said status quo. So let's talk about where adaptation plays a role in how we evolve and where we evolve from. Um, and also, let's talk about where we're potentially, excitingly, evolving to. But let's talk about first the evolve to. Where are we heading? Well, because we are so adaptive and we're pushing the edge of the envelope, then we are, in a sense, evolving when we go off planet and we see that our body starts to change. Um, that can have many implications, but the important take home is that we are a product of our environment. Therefore, we are not a mystery, but rather we are a reflection of our environment. When we talk about it here on Earth, look around us. We think we are who we are because it's what we know. But actually, we have formed in the way that we look based on our environment, on the trees, on the atmosphere, on gravity. And if those things were to change, we look differently. The best way to describe that in a very dynamic way is to put it in the context of deep space exploration. Let's say we decide to go beyond the moon, beyond Mars. Let's say we go to some far distant star and it takes us 90 years to get there. And we're going to be, of course, in suspended animation. We'll be hibernating probably we'll be sleeping, our metabolic rate will be very low, but before we go to sleep, we're gonna make sure that we're packed for Mars and beyond, that we have all of the life support that we need, oxygen, water, all of those wonderful sorts of things, so that we can sleep peacefully, knowing that when we wake up, we have oxygen, even if we're in an environment where the atmosphere is not conducive. But what happens if while you were sleeping, you evolved along the way? And finally, you arrived at your destination, you wake up, life is wonderful, except you've evolved now, where you no longer require oxygen, but helium or carbon dioxide. And the only thing you've got packed in your suitcase is oxygen. So that's not a good day. <laughs> that first breath may be your last. And that's why it's important that we don't think exploration-wise just in terms of our environment here, but let's think about where we're heading, where we might go, and what we might really need to pack and carry along with us. So that's physiologic adaptation. But in society, in civilized society or otherwise, well, again, we are not a mystery, but rather a reflection of our environment. That could be good. And that could be bad. It could be for better or for worse. Basically, garbage in, garbage out. Or if we choose, it could be gracefully born in and gracefully bow out. So that leaves us with where we came from. And this is where my deep reflections, I love this. I have, I'm unleashed now to kind of go into my deep thoughts where we come from. The cosmos meets our, the best that we have to give. We are all born of the cosmos. We are all dust. Created by whatever greater power or energy 
hydrogen, we choose to believe in. But too much time has been squandered on who created us when the compelling question is not who, but rather why we were created. The universe is billions and billions and billions and billions of years old, and yet, relatively speaking, even with going to the moon and back, in the words of Brian Greene, we have barely left the shore. But on the other hand, in a relatively short period of time, less than a microsecond of the flap of a hummingbird's wing, we have gone all the way from crawling to launch, all the way from horses to spacecraft, all the way from half a century ago landing a human on the moon and as Katherine Johnson, Dr. Katherine Johnson says, she would never send a crew member somewhere that she couldn't get them back from. So we've gone all the way, not just to the moon, thank you Edgar, and back, but in an even shorter period of time, we go in just a few words in the exact reverse, from weightless birth to learning how to gravity balance. So why would the cosmos by whatever greater power or being or energy that we believe created us, why would the cosmos create the body zero to serve as that human lens to witness and experience the cosmos? There must be something pretty remarkable about all of us for all of our flaws and fails for the universe to be compelled to create this human lens as if, as if the only way that the cosmos had to uniquely and authentically experience the full breadth and depth of itself, as if for all of its greatness on some exquisite level, the true meaning, if not purpose, of the cosmos is not solely what we discover in the outer space, but rather what lies within our inner spaces. With our eternal legacy somehow ever mercifully redeemed in how we live, love, hope, and dream. Thank you.